Mr. Sees. Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court. My name is Matthew Cease, and I'm here to represent Keon Harrison in this case. Today, we ask that this court continue leading the country in juvenile justice reform. And we believe that reversal is required in this case for several reasons, but instead we're gonna focus on two specific issues. First, we believe that his conviction is a violation of due process and is fundamentally unfair as applied for juveniles to be subjected to the felony murder rule. Secondly, we believe that the sentence that was imposed upon Mr. Harrison is a cruel and unusual punishment under both the Iowa and the United States Constitution. This case presents a crossroads of the recent authority from both this court and the United States Supreme Court in juvenile justice reform and the recognition that juveniles are different and should be treated differently than adults in our criminal justice system. And that is with the application of the felony murder rule. I think in order to understand our argument, you need to look at what is the felony murder rule. The felony murder rule, as this court has articulated throughout Heemstra and subsequent cases, involves the understanding that certain felonies are so inherently dangerous that there's gonna be an understanding that um, a, a death may arise from that. It's based on foreseeability. And this is exactly what we know through the science over the last 20 years, and, and as this court and the United States Supreme Court has found, is not applicable to juveniles. Juveniles don't have that foresight, they don't have impulse control and, and things of that sort to allow them to appreciate that known risk. I mean, Mr. Slovin in his brief, I mean, kind of takes that head on, and he cites a lot of this brain science to the effect that juveniles can foresee. It's the impulse control. It's the other, it's the brakes they lack, not not the vision. But I uh, think, is that wrong or is that incorrect? Is he misreading the science? I think he is somewhat misreading the science because the issue always is foreseeability and that's why we have diminished culpability and why it's why we understand that there is diminished culpability for children but also I think that the lack of breaks is equally important in the felony murder context because when you have the inability or the lack of breaks once this felony starts and it gets going and especially like this case is a perfect example example Mr. Harrison had no knowledge that anybody was going to get killed. He didn't have a gun. He didn't, I think the evidence shows that it's unclear of whether he even knew a gun was going to be involved in this case. And he lacked, as his status as a juvenile, the ability to stop this when things started to go awry. And you see that in a lot of these, um, these cases, that it's, it's not, even if the foreseeability thing that the state states is, is an issue, the lack of breaks is equally important when you apply that to juveniles. And that's why it's fundamentally unfair to allow that to happen um, to, to juveniles and to impose the felony murder rule to juveniles as a whole. Um, and, and I think it also- You would acknowledge that we've already decided the fact that the felony murder rule itself is, doesn't violate due process. So you acknowledge that you're simply wanting to extend it then to say that because juveniles are different then it sh shouldn't be applied to them. I, I would, yeah, this, okay. this court has specifically said as it applies to adults, it does not violate due process. And, and I would acknowledge that and it goes all the way back to um, probably the Connor case is the most, the most clear along with um, the Raglan case from the 1980s, not the, the juvenile sentencing Raglan case. Um, but those, those issues have been addressed. But the problem is, is that we're dealing with juveniles. And this court and the United States Supreme Court has always recognized that juveniles are different and they need to be treated differently. But, we've, but the U.S. Supreme Court and so far our court has only applied that for sentencing and to strike down automatic mandatory sentencing. You're asking us to take a big step beyond that to change a sub, substantive uh, definition of a crime as applied to juveniles. Has any other court done that? Not 
hold, I'm going to break that down into two parts. First, I disagree that the Supreme Court has only held this in the sentencing context. You have JDB versus North Carolina, which recognizes that the age of the juvenile must be considered when looking at the Miranda warnings and, and whether or not the individual is in custody. But that, that wasn't how, redefining or taking a category, a, a, di, a statutorily defined crime, and saying you can't apply this crime to someone because of their age, right? I would agree with that. I would agree with that. But it is still a constitutional extension of all of the science that's happening with juveniles. And so it's not, these, these cases, I don't believe, are ever limited to that juvenile analysis. Second, um, no, I'm not aware of any country in, or any state in the country that, um, that has held this. But that doesn't mean that that's wrong. Lyle was, um, this case, or this court acted at the forefront of Lyle, and, and I think the court specifically noted that this was the first time in the country that we would do the holding that we did in Lyle. Um, and I think that that's exactly what we're asking today. We find that the assault and the robbery can't be the predicate for the felony murder rule. We don't have to address this issue, do we? I think that that's right. And I tell, tell me why the assault and a robbery case should not be the predicate's assault. Well, I think it can be if it's the right assault and if it's sufficiently removed from that specific act. Just, um, and, and so I think you're talking about the Heemstra type analysis with the merger, is that right? Right. Um, yeah, so I think if the assault is pr a properly removed from the robbery, then that absolutely um, can be still a case. And I think what the, the example when that would happen. Sure, if, if you're pointing the gun at one person and it misses that person and it goes to the person behind them. So you're committing an assault on the individual in which you shot them or attempted to shoot at them, but you killed somebody behind them. So I think that there are instances in which a robbery can happen. But when you have a situation like the state says, in this case, in the closing argument, that hey, the assault here is easy to determine because boom, 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 he shot him and he's, and he's dead. That's the assault and that's the merger problem that you have when you look at um, the Heemstra analysis. If they went in and uh, didn't intend to rob the person, but just intended to assault the person in the manner in this case, would it be a fair statement that their Heemstra wouldn't allow the assault to stand as a predicate? I think that's exactly right, because a robbery requires the theft in addition to the assault. And so it wouldn't be a robbery, I think it would be a felonious assault at that point, and then you have um, a Heemstra violation and it would not be That applicable. really what takes it outside of Heemstra and, and makes it classic felony murder, the fact that there's this additional element of intent to commit a theft. You don't have, you don't have a felonious injurious act that just completely merges into the murder the way you did in Heemstra, right? Yeah, there, that, that's true, but um, you still have the Heemstra mer or merger problem when the underlying assault, um, if it's the right type of assault like we've got in this case, and not the one that I described to, to Justice Wiggins, um, they do merge at that point. And you're also assuming, which is another issue in this case, is that um, what level of assault are you actually having? Because um, the robbery third statute was, was added after the or before the trial in this case happened where you can have non-felonious robberies now. And, and the jury was not instructed on that in this particular case, um, which we've alleged as, as an error. But you can have non-felonious assaults that, that create a robbery, which I think are also um, a, a different extension of this. Now, let me ask you, has that issue been preserved, properly preserved for our review, the idea of a non-felonious assault? I, I believe it has been. Um, first, it was raised um, in, uh, first there was this general objection that was made by defense counsel as applicable of, or the felony murder as applicable in any ways. They objected to that instruction entirely. They also raised it in um, a motion arrest of judgment filing after the trial. And they ra when they raised that, are you talking they, about the application for new trial or another motion and arrest of judgment? There was there was a motion arrest of judgment, and then there was also a motion for a new trial. Both of these issues were raised at the district court, um, and I believe it was the motion arrest of judgment that specifically addressed the robbery third, and the motion for a new trial focused more on the uh, um, the felony murder issues that I'm raising here today as well. But um, 
and the court ruled on it, the district court ruled on it, and, um, and it was objected to by, by the state at that time. So we believe the error has been preserved on that particular issue. And I think, um, just as a side note, this court um, in December ruled on State versus Ortiz that it's necessary that um, the jury has to be informed of the robbery third. And so in, in reading the state's brief, they do raise the issue that, well, there was an assault because there was some shoving going back and forth. Well, if that's the case, then he doesn't have felony murder because it's a robbery third. And I think that's an important distinction um, to make as well with, with this. Another error preservation question. You know, what about the state's position that the constitutional objection to felony, uh, uh, to felony murder for juveniles wasn't preserved because that wasn't raised until just before the case went to the jury. Now, if you had raised or if defense counsel at trial had raised that, that challenge earlier in the case, the state, for example, might not have dropped first degree robbery, which I think you would agree there was plenty of support in the record for that, at yeah. least, yeah. And, and would that would, and, and wouldn't have proceeded solely on a felony murder theory. Yeah. Um, so what about that argument? A couple of things. First, I want to address that issue about dropping the, the robbery charge. I think that also goes to the fundamental fairness of all of this. And I think when you look at that and see what actually happened, I think you can reasonably say that the, the prosecutors were concerned of a compromised verdict because they knew Mr. Harrison was not the individual that killed anybody. And so they, they made that strategic decision to withdraw that. And I think that goes to the fundamental fairness argument um, to some respect. But as for the error preservation, um, we outlined it in our brief, um, in, in our reply brief specifically, we cite a case um, at length where it talks about if the issue is raised, um, the constitutional issue is raised before the district court, the state does not object to it, and the court, the district court ultimately rules on that decision, error preservation is not an issue any longer. And I think that that's a, um, a key thing because when that argument was, was made, the state didn't say, hey, wait, you, didn't, you should have raised this earlier. We're not going to address this. And the court didn't say, oh, man, I need more time to um, address this issue. Everybody took it and ruled on it and made their objections and made their record. Nobody's ever alleged that they didn't make a record or, or was not able to present something that they wanted to present with it. And I think you would need to do that in order for it to be a true error preservation. So essentially, and I think what's cited in the case that we cited in our reply brief, it's a form over substance um, issue that's being raised by the state on Mr. that. Mr. Cisa, is your argument uh, this afternoon unique to felony murder or would it apply to any criminal offense where um, a person commits one criminal act and causes consequences of harm to another, like reckless driving causing the death of another person or OWI resulting in the death of another person. Are you actually making a broader argument this afternoon? I, I don't believe that I am. Um, I think that those are the two closest arguments to, um, to where this would, these, these issues intertwine in somewhat, but I don't, I don't believe that I am. I think that felony murder is unique. And, and I think that everybody and all the legal commentators recognize that it is unique. And that's why, um, as, as we cited in our briefs and, um, and the legal authorities that are associated with it, always recognize that it is the most controversial um, um, crime that's, that's out there. And, and I think that's because of this presumption and um, this inherent foreseeability that happens with inherently dangerous activities that gets imputed onto the defendant. And I don't think that that happens as much in those types of cases. Um, and so I don't believe that there is any extension beyond the felony murder rule um, and, and, uh, and juveniles. Um, just briefly, I also want to touch on um, why I think that this sentence um, is grossly disproportionate for what happened to Mr. Harrison. And that is, um, if you look at the, the United States Supreme Court in Edmund um, from the 1980s, it talks, it involved a very similar fact pattern in where you had um, a, a, an accomplice to a robbery that was not involved in the actual killing or doing anything with it. The Supreme Court said um, that the death penalty is inapplicable in those cases. And then you apply um, Graham, which recognizes that juveniles are twice, or not juveniles, people that do not kill and do not intend to kill 
lack twice the moral culpability as the principal that actually does the killing in, um, in, in a particular case. But what we have here is that Mr. Harrison is sentenced in the exact same way, in the exact same manner as the principal, despite him lacking twice the moral culpability that, um, that the principal had in it. And that makes it, a, I, we believe, a disproportionate sentence. Thank you. Mr. Cease, thank you as well. Mr. Sloven. Thank you, Mr. Ju uh, Chief Justice. May it please the court, counsel. Good afternoon, it's good to be here. For this due process challenge, the way I visualize it is there's, there's an island in the middle of foreseeability. There needs to be a bridge to it that establishes that foreseeability is the reason why juveniles are treated differently in the, in the justice system. There needs to be a bridge away from it, establishing a link that that's the reason, that's an element or, or the rationale of felony murder. I don't really think either of those are effectively established. And even then, I'm not sure that, that it really states a claim that would justify taking this, this unprecedented step of, change, of, of holding that the substantive rules defining criminal offenses don't apply to juvenile offenders. When I look at the jury instructions in this, in this case and the way it was charged and the way the law works, it's important to note that Mr. Harrison needed to have been found to have aided and abetted the shooting. Not just the robbery, not just participating in the robbery, but also the shooting. Uh, that, and that isn't right under the law. I mean, even, I, I don't think that's right. Even under the Connor case, he has to have all, to aid, he has to have aided and abetted the, the first degree robbery. So he has to have all the mens rea associated with first degree robbery, including the fact, I guess, he's on the scene, he knows there's going to be a gun, he knows there's a robbery, he has all that. He doesn't have to have the mens rea associated with the shooting. That's what makes it felony murder, right? Well, he, de he definitely doesn't need to intentionally, premeditatedly, deliberately kill a person. That's what makes it felony murder is that he killed someone while participating in a felony, in a forcible felony. But notice that it... it for principal liability, it has to be he killed someone while participating in a forcible felony. For aiding and abetting liability, it has to be he aided and abetted the killing of someone while participating in a forcible felony. And I think the jury was instructed accordingly that he had to knowingly approve and agree to the commission of a crime, the crime being first degree murder, either by active participation in it or by knowingly advising or encouraging the act in some way before or when it is committed. Now, uh, if the phrase, aided and abetted, the defendant or someone he aided and abetted uh, shot Aaron McHenry was used both in the first degree murder instruction and in the, in the second degree murder instruction, even without the bit about the defendant or someone he aided and abetted participated in a robbery. I think it's very clear that he had to aid and abet the shooting in order to be liable. Now for joint criminal what conduct. The record, what in the record is there to, to show that he aided and abetted the shooting? I understand, I think, what's in the record, aiding and abetting of the robbery, but, but help me out here. Sure, so the, the evidence is, obviously we're not gonna have direct evidence of an agreement to commit the crime in a specific way because neither of them tef, uh, testified, but we do know that they agreed to go and commit this robbery. The evidence suggests that Mr. Harrison knew that Collins was carrying a gun, otherwise I don't think there's any reason to believe that they would be able to rob a drug dealer. Then what's, what's the evidence to support that proposition? Just, you're, you're just inferring that they're doing a robbery, there must be a gun? Uh, he changes pants to be able to carry the gun in his pants. He, uh, leads, he leads Mr. McHenry to the site uh, and, and sets him up in such a position. The shoving happens that Mr. Gutierrez describes in his testimony. And then the shots that are fired, one hits Mr. McHenry in the back, then another, uh, I think a series of them in the front of his body, and then after that, he spends the entire rest of the day with Mr. Collins dividing the ill-gotten gains, and then he covers for him in, or, or at least he doesn't, uh, knowing the stakes, and after hearing those gunshots, then he continues to obfuscate and conceal the details of the crime. And as the jury was instructed, uh, the, I'm sorry, the conduct following the crime can be considered uh, if it tends to prove the defendant's earlier participation. And I think that this tends to show that uh, it did not change Mr. Harrison's conduct when a murder was committed, that that was part and parcel with the, or at least it wasn't enough 
to make him withdraw or change course. And I think that there's definitely substantial evidence there from which you can infer that he was an active participant or knowingly encouraged this crime. Again, I don't have trouble with the notion he's aiding and abetting first degree robbery based on viewing the evidence in the light most favorable of pros prosecution. But he here's what we said in Connor. Defendants claim that the felony murder statute requires he must be proved to have the mens rea of malice of forethought requires a contorted interpretation of the statute. Under this theory, it would be a rare occasion when a person who was aided in ability, abetted a felony would be convicted of felony murder. What you're saying is the instructions here actually required the jury to find that he had malice aforethought? Uh, he had malice aforethought or aided and abetted someone who acted with malice aforethought. I think the thing about Connor is that uh, the use of the phrase aiding and abetting is a little unfortunate because I think that case was really about joint criminal conduct and imputation of liability in that way where foreseeability does matter in that context. But it, it has to be found by the jury. The jury has to be instructed on that. In that context, the jury finds foreseeability and there's no imputation. In this context, with principal liability, aiding and abetting liability, the jury finds specific participation, active encouragement, finds that someone had malice aforethought there's, there's no due process problem at all. And there's no due process problem at all with the, the instructions to let them infer malice from a person's actions. That's a permissive presumption that's not the same thing as Sandstrom. That part was established in Connor and is appropriate here. I, I think more an, than Connor. Another question on jury instructions. Should the court have instructed on the new robbery third statute? Did that apply to this crime? I don't think so. I think that Chrisman establishes that while there can be a lower penalty when the legislature acts after the commission of the crime, the classification of the crime doesn't change. So if it was a forcible felony then, it's still a forcible felony in these instructions. I'd add that this is not preserved at all. It was deliberately held back and not brought up during the discussion of the jury instructions in order to gain a strategic advantage. I think that if it had been brought up, it would have been easy for the state to say, look, somebody there was a dangerous weapon involved. It's clearly not a simple assault. This is a robbery. And, and I think that's a good time to transition to Heemstra because Heemstra itself cites a number of authorities that establish that robbery is one of the traditional uh, independent felonious intent crimes that can establish a predicate felony for felony murder. Now, even beyond the fact that the legislature has included it specifically in the statute that defines what these forcible felonies are, I think that the, the analysis in Heemstra, the concern for bootstrapping, vanishes when you consider robbery. That robbery is an independent, felonious act, the promotion of which through a violent assault is what we're trying to, to isolate and punish with felony murder. We're not elevating all willful injury into first degree murder here. We're elevating specifically those robberies, those attempted theft plus assault that then result in death, elevating those only to felony murder. What percentage of robberies result in death? I have no idea, Your Honor. But I would say that there's, there's a fair, actually, I, I knew at one point, but I don't now. Something like 0.5. That's not helpful, is it? Something like 0.5%, does that ring a bell to you? That might be right. I think that the, it, it's not necessarily, Prob it, the reason isn't necessarily that it's inherently probable somebody will die. It's the inherent dangerousness and the inherent probability of some injury, the inherent magnification of danger. Certainly whatever number of people die in the commission of a robbery uh, is much higher than the proportion of people who die while minding their own business not being robbed. Surely true, but uh, so for a juvenile, um, uh, aren't there challenges in understanding the consequences of one's act uh, if it is true that, that, that robbery results in death on 0.5% on a rare occasion, uh, wouldn't uh, someone with, uh, with a juvenile mind have difficulty understanding that the consequences of engaging in a robbery might be um, the death of an individual? So I want to I wanna take this opportunity to respond to both that question and this argument that foreseeability, juvenile's problem with foreseeability, is the reason why we have this juvenile sentencing jurisprudence. The science that we cited, I think, is persuasive and, and does a good job of summarizing the research that the problem with juveniles is not their headlights, it's their brakes. By, by 16, 17, 18, they're at a point where intellectually they can comprehend the consequences of their actions, can comprehend what's going to happen if he tells Can't the truth to the police. Risks. I mean, that's the, that in all of the literature that I've seen, it's it's 
It's not a cognitive function. I mean, they're, they're excellent in algebra <laughs> to use something simply, of which many of us are not. But it's, it's, it's understanding the, the gravity of the risks. It's the judgment that they're lacking. Now, is that, number one, is that fair? Um, and two, if it is fair, what's the consequence? I, I, would, I would say you're close. I, I wouldn't say it's understanding the gravity. I would say it's assigning weight to the gravity of the offenses. And, and the, the uh, motivational judgment portions of their decision making. I'd say the, the big reasons why we treat juveniles differently are, are you know, one, their decision making specifically under pressure is not great, a lot worse comparatively than their decision making in cold situations. Not that they can't recognize what's happening, but that they're worse at controlling uh, or w worse at making good decisions. Second, that their sensitivity to rewards and costs, they overweight rewards, and that causes them to act differently. And all of this builds to number three, which is that their those plus the fact that their character isn't fully formed means that when a juvenile does something that's culpable, it's not as much of an indicator of their inherent blameworthiness as it is for an adult. And their character isn't fully formed, and that's why we hesitate before making any judgment about irretrievable corruptibility. And that's why Mr. Harrison got life with immediate parole eligibility, the full benefit to which he was entitled under our Lyle suite, all of that line of cases. People v. Dillon's a California case. You may be familiar with it, uh, but it's a felony murder as well. Um, actually, in that case, he was a shooter. And the California Supreme Court said, boy, li a possibility of life imprisonment for this juvenile is, is cruel and unusual, actually, under the state constitution. Uh, and the notion, I think, I, I'm embellishing a little bit maybe, but, but, but the notion was, well, um, the felony murder rule already extends criminal liability to the far frontiers because, because you know, um, it includes situations where you're not the shooter and where you're just engaging in, in what might be a robbery. Um, so we're on the frontiers of, of extending criminal culpability already, and then when we have a juvenile, that, that pushes us over the edge. Um, um, response? So I think I have two responses. The first is that California's felony murder rule is a little different than Iowa's. Iowa's is, is constrained by exactly the, what I've described, that it either has to be principal aiding and abetting or joint criminal conduct, where the jury would have to find foreseeability in that situation. The other thing I would say is that while that may be true when you're talking about life without the opportunity for parole. But that wasn't, and Dylan, it was a, just a maximum of 50 years. Well, I, th I think that that ultimately has to be a legislative judgment, and as long as it's made within constitutional parameters, it, it's something that the legislature has to be free to define the severity of the crime. And, that, and, and that's something I think is missing from uh, the defendant's entire cruel and unusual punishment analysis is any attempt to grapple with the fact that a man died as a result of the robbery in which, uh, and the shooting in which Mr. Harrison uh, participated and, and encouraged and then sought to, to profit from. I think that there has to be some recognition, and yes, this may be the same sentence that a lot of juvenile, first, you know, traditional first-degree murderers are, are going to receive, uh, and yet, when we've imposed a, a cap saying this is the most severe punishment that anybody can receive, we can't be surprised when uh, some people who commit crimes that are not as serious as the very worst offenders also receive it. That this punishment is, and, and we, you know, we said in Louis L that that this punishment recognizes the community's interest, very strong interest in punishing and stopping first degree murder. Uh, indeed, it's, it's interest in ensuring a recidivism, recidivism rate for first degree murder of 0%. And it, you know, when you sever away the unconstitutional parts of the sentence, of the sta sentencing statute, you're left with life with immediate parole eligibility. I just don't see anything here that would enable or that would change that result, that would send this into Bruger. This is an armed robbery. Mr. McHenry was shot five times. Evidence of the defendant's participation is pretty clear. So to transition to the error preservation argument about the constitutional challenge, I would agree that the state did not respond to that challenge by saying this is not timely. But the court itself sua sponte raised the timeliness issue and said, look, I, I don't know how I'm supposed to meaningfully rule on this challenge at this point. All of the state's evidence is already in. 
we're, we're doing the jury instructions, and this is a constitutional challenge, the, a challenge to the constitutional validity of the statute, it's, it's too late for that to be ruled on in any meaningful way. And I think that if, if I think that that enables us to renew an argument about that same concern that the district court raised when it made those remarks and said, I just don't have a way to rule on this at this point. And I think that, that the court was correct, that if we had known, and I, I think that, um, I think- The court should be making a state's argument though. I mean, I, I understand what you're saying, and I think you <laughs> accurately reflect what I saw on the record. Um, I mean, the court did express, I think, I mean, I read it as a little bit of frustration, a little, and maybe even irritation. I mean, I, you know, so here we are uh, haggling over instructions and you're bringing this up now, um, and preferably, substantial issues we'd like to hear early, maybe a motion limine, but you know, we, we, we'd like some. Um, but, but the state didn't object and the court ended up ruling. Um, uh, so, I mean, the, the, the court should not be in the position of being advocate for the state, I don't imagine, that you don't disagree. And if I could, thank you. So I, I, I definitely agree with that as a general point. I would make two responses. The first is that, uh, like this court and the Court of Appeals, uh, judges frequently will will bring up error preservation and timeliness at, on their own initiative as a way of protecting the, the function of the courts and the need to you know for appropriate time to rule on issues presented and I would say that 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 happens in our appellate decisions we don't consider it making the argument on behalf of, of one party or another I think that the same principle holds true here uh, and then I would I would also say that the I think that the, the states, the fact that it was ruled upon doesn't mean that the error preservation argument can't be, can't be, or the timeliness argument can't be reached here. The ruling can happen, as it, again, it happens in appellate courts, uh, can recognize the timeliness issue and reach the merits notwithstanding it, at least as a fallback. Uh, for those reasons, we urge affirmance. Thank you. Mr. Sullivan, thank you. Mr. Cease. He said, "Like you to address a point that was made by counsel that um, after these events, uh, your client uh, didn't run away in shock or fear, or you know, but ended up uh, as." And I'll elaborate a little bit. I mean, he, your client ends up not only not running away, but almost embracing the transaction. Ends up, as I understand it, smoking marijuana. Yeah, abs uh, absolutely. Et cetera, I, don't, et cetera, you know. I don't hide from that. And, and in fact, what all of our juvenile cases show is that that's exactly to be expected. They're not understanding what happened. They're not appreciating it. They're, they're more reckless. And um, in the, the amicus brief, it, we specifically, or the amicus people specifically state, juveniles act in, in more reckless behavior and, and, and take more risks than other, than other adults normally would in that situation. And peer pressure, keep in mind, he's hanging around with a guy that just killed somebody. And so I think for him to stick On around. On that peer pressure, I noticed the amicus said that, this, that the person he was hanging around with it was an adult. It was another Hoover student, right? Yeah, it was right. also a juvenile, He right? was a, a little over a year older than But him. they were both juveniles. Yes, that he was, he was um, I believe, 17 in like four months. The Keith Collins was 17 in four months. That was a misstatement by them, just not probably having full access to the records um, at the time. But yeah, the, the co-defendant was um, also a juvenile and also received a, a, a punishment of life with uh, the possibility of parole. Um, but that was gonna go to my next point uh, as well. And even if the foreseeability issue is not just um, a foreseeability, or if, if you wanna take the foreseeability side of it away and, and agree that the headlights um, analogy, that they have properly functioning headlights, um, it, everything else that we have looked at um, as it applies to juveniles, is still applicable to the felony murder rule. I tried to write down um, uh, the, my best of uh, research of what we actually say that juveniles lack. They lack reasoning, they lack abstract thinking, they lack planning, they lack an anticipation of consequences, impulse control, they can't assess, ri or assess risk, and they lack self-control. Every one of those things still go towards why the felony murder rule should not be applicable to juveniles, especially to um, 
uh, juveniles that are involved as accessories, like Mr. Harrison is. Um, it's not necessarily always a foreseeability thing. It's being able to put the brakes on when this is starting to go awry or, or remove themselves from it. And that's why you see Mr. Harrison still hanging out with this guy after, after the murder actually happened. Will you, will you make the argument uh, that I heard from the state at least that, well, he's eligible for parole. Didn't quite phrase it this way, so I'll, I'll rephrase it. Uh, um, yeah, maybe a maximum of 50 years, but immediate eligibility for parole. So. Um, what's the problem? I mean, yeah, I, I, I cited a, a brief, and, and this was addressed a little bit in Lewis Cell, um, but I, I cited in my brief that the reality is is that these juveniles across the country and, and in Iowa, when they are, even though we've had Miller and, and all of these cases um, to, to eliminate life without the possibility of parole, they're not being released in any sort of meaningful way. And I think um, I cited this recent um, AP analysis. Um, the Associated Press analysis where they went through and we tallied them up and it looked like um, at the time that Miller came out there was about 3,200 juveniles in throughout the country that had life without parole sentences and as of I believe July of last year only 150 or 156 had actually been released so I don't believe that it is meaningful and um, well but but that's what we've decided through our entire string of cases is that we are going to in fact leave this to the parole board that they're in the best position to make a determination as to when somebody should be released. So do you object to that? Or you, you're saying it's, it's meaningless? Is that what you're saying? Well, I, I don't know. I can't make that position in this record because obviously this is a direct appeal. He hasn't been in front of any sort of a parole board. But the empirical evidence is starting to, I believe, establish that that, that, that it may be, the, very well may be the case. And the other problem is, is that we are, um, supposing that um, it's fair for him to receive the possibility of not being eligible for parole and, and being sentenced in the exact same way as the principal when, um, when he doesn't have the moral culpability um, that the, the principal actually has. But those are the things that the parole board can take into consideration. I mean, when they consider him for rehabilitation and possible parole, then they'll look at the fact that he wasn't, in fact, the shooter. He did, in fact, get caught up in the felony murder rule, and those will all be things that will, in fact, uh, lead him more likely to be released you know, once he's uh, been rehabilitated. Isn't that correct? If, if that was the only thing that the parole board was to consider, I would agree with you. But there is a long list of factories, and a lot of the stuff is involving how he is as uh, a prisoner. Is he a model prisoner? What kinds of programs, if any programs, are even available to him? Um, so all of those things also go into that analysis, and I think that is an important thing for the, the court to consider. Thank you. Mr. Cease, thank you as well. Mr. Sloman, thank you again. The case of uh, State versus Harrison is now then submitted, and the bailiff may adjourn. Hear ye, hear ye. The Honorable Supreme Court of the State of Iowa is now adjourned.